Great. Thank you for that, Wendy. And this, for those who, don't, who can't see it, there is demolition of Lindy's house happening here as we speak. Uh, I wanted to take the opportunity to also introduce a very special guest for uh, with us today, Sarah. Um, Sarah is a life Lindy, Lindy with ACP Biolife, and she herself has sa helped save so many young kangaroos, wallabies, and marsupials from inner on Canberra. And Sarah and I are now going to take questions from this from the young stars and help Lindy uh, understand. Help, 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 Lindy, help us understand better. Yes, any so, questions? First one from Katie is, and Sarah, feel free to jump in. Uh, first question from Katie is, why are ba the baby wombat's claws so big when they're so young? Look, and that's one of the questions I often have because I have no idea what purpose these great big claws have while they're in their mum's pouch. Once they start digging, they need these claws then for um, excavating earth and they can move something like a cubic metre of soil in a night of digging. They're, they're incredibly efficient diggers um, and they wear their claws down there once they start digging. But as tiny babies, they have those beautiful long claws and I don't know what the purpose is. Yeah. Hey. Hi, everyone. Um, so just got a, another question here from Jess, um, just about what is thermoregulation? Oh, thermoregulation is the ability of an animal to maintain its own body temperature. So um, things like frogs uh, and, and rep other reptiles, so snakes and lizards, have to sit in the sun in order to get warmth from their environment so that their body stays warm. Thermoregulating is what mammals do and we generate our own warmth. So we all stay at around 36 or 37 degrees Celsius all the time. So if it's cold outside, our body stays warm, even if our skin feels a little bit cool. And if it's hot outside, we stay that temperature and we lose excess heat through our skin with perspiration um, and, uh, and, and flushing, looking a bit red. Our body pushes um, extra blood to the surface of the skin to let breezes cool it a little bit. So, so we stay, we keep our temperature around 36 or 37 degrees all the time when we're healthy. Right. You have a cat there, Sarah. I do. She snuck into the screen. She's not native wildlife. She's just around. <laughs> <hanging around. laughs> from the but, um, uh, yeah. For both you guys, Sarah mm -hmm. and Lindy, do you guys look after many other animals other than wombats? <laughs> um, I, I've got a baby possum at the moment who's in a cage and he actually isn't keen to come out, so I won't show him. He doesn't like to be held. Um, I've looked after everything from all the different species of birds. I don't do lizards. I'm sorry. I know people love lizards, but I don't. I guess I <laughs> <laughs> um, And I've had wallabies um, and, and obviously lots of wombats. Um, but other people have different animals. Sarah, do you have any animals in care or have you had? Uh, not at the moment, but I do have an aviary set up for possums. For possums? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so just another question for you, Lindy. Um, how do orphan koalas get their pap when you care from them? Uh, now, look, that's a, that's a good question. And it's one that is a little bit, a bit yucky to have to answer. But since somebody's asked, asked, asked it, I will. Orphaned koalas um, still need to have the pap. Otherwise, they just can't digest their food. And so there are people who, who collect road killed koalas so koalas that have been hit by a car and they do an operation on it to remove the pap from the mother's body and then that's collected and stored for the for the baby koalas to have so it sounds really yucky but it's the only way to give the babies the the good bacteria that they need so that they can continue to grow mm -hmm. yeah just one of those things unfortunately um, wildlife carers get to do a lot of yucky stuff <laughs> Hey, question from Alyssa for both of you guys. Mm -hmm. Do wombats make any sounds? They do, they do. Um, baby wombats, if they're calling their mum, make a little huffing noise and they just go huff, 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 huff. And that just means, mum, mum, where are you? Um, if they're frightened, that huffing noise gets louder and it's a bit like a kid yelling, mum. And if they're really angry, they make a big growling noise and that means nick off. That's, so that's their, that's their three sounds. Huff, huff, huff. Huff, huff, huff. <laughs> uh, um, okay, the next question is from Katie. Um, and she's asking whether it's a problem to release animals that are so used to humans. 
But that's a great, a great question and we get asked that lots of times. Um, we, one of the great things about wildlife is they're, they're hardwired to be wild. So um, they'll, they'll revert back to being wild very easily. Now, the other great thing is that when these animals get to be sort of like about teenage development, they start to not want to be near their mums. Like, which is us, a bit like human teenagers, that after a while they start to want to do things by themselves. Our job as carers is to let them. So we have to, even though they're really cute and we love them, if they show signs of not wanting to be near us, then we have to let them not be near us. And so we really encourage that. So by the time they're released, these animals won't have seen their carer for several weeks or months. They will have been living outside in a burrow in their carer's yard. We all have enclosures with burrows. Um, and they'll be looking after themselves. They won't be aware that we've gone in and, and cleaned the water and put fresh food out for them. So it's, um, it's a lot of work, but we, we go through a process to make sure they're very wild when they're released. Now and we've got one released wombat that didn't do very well at being wild, but she lives on somebody's property and he visits her once a week to make sure that she's okay. And that's working really well. She's wild six days of the week. And on, the, on one day, um, she gets to hang out with her human and and um, feel a bit happier again about being a wild wombat. Um, question, Lindy. Mm -hmm. How heavy is Harriet? Harriet's about 10 or 11 kilos. Oh. And it's solid weight. They are very, very muscular animals. So, and they also have very short limbs. So all of her weight is around her body, um, which means it's like having a sack of potatoes sitting on my lap. Um, and she's only half grown. No, not even half grown. When she's released, she'll be about 18 kilos. But when she's fully grown, she'll be about 30 kilos. Hi. Uh, I'm just going to go to the mm -hmm. chat to see if we've got more questions. There's someone who says that uh, Harriet looks like a tardy grade. According to Evan, well, Harriet looks like a tardy grade. Well, when they're pinkies, I can see why you would think that, because they just are um, just sort of like wrinkled tube-shaped things with a, a bit of a face on the end. And I love tardy grades. They'd be my second favourite animal creature that <laughs> form. I, th I saw one once we had them in our fish pond I was so excited. <laughs> um, question guys uh, for Sarah. Hey Sarah what's the way to tell if a wombat's a male or a female? <laughs> That's not fair. Lindy knows a lot more about wombats. Do we have a can we put the camera on? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah I think there's a camera. So this is Harriet. Oops Harriet's a girl <laughs> and she has a tiny baby pouch in there ready for when she's a grown up. So we can see the pouch opening on the little girls. So she's got hers all there. Even when she's the tiniest, tiniest little pinky, that pouch was already formed. So it's really easy to see. And, and if she was a boy, she'd have a little pair of testicles sitting there instead, which are very obvious as well. So they make it easiest for us to tell whether they're boys or girls. Oh, she's just too beautiful. <laughs> um. Oh, so Lindy, there's another question in the chat here from Peter. Um, he's asking how the orphan wombats know how to burrow if they aren't shown by other wombats. Uh, and that's the amazing thing. They know how to burrow. Right from the very beginning, um, they start digging. We provide them with um, lots of time outside. And even as tiny babies, as soon as they start walking, they'll start scrabbling around and, and making pretend diggings. Um, so all of our wombats have to dig a burrow before they are released. So all of our enclosures have got space for them to dig a burrow. They've got to dig it and live in it before they're released. <coughs> when we release them, though, we do release them into a burrow that's already um, out there in the wild that's mm -hmm. empty. It doesn't have a wombat living in it just to make it easy for them. So we don't expect them to. Um, have to dig their own burrow. So we start them off, they have one, a burrow to go into and they can move to another one or build their own if they want to. All right. Um, question from Amanda. Uh, are the thumbs on the back to help them balance better? Look, and it, it could be they've got um, their feet turn in. So when they, when they walk, their back feet are sort of like pigeon toed. They turn in and because that toe doesn't do anything, it, it folds out of the way as they make that walking movement. So it's possibly something to do with that interesting gait they have of, of their back feet turning in, very, very pigeon-toed. Whether it's cause or effect, I couldn't say. Um, but yes, definitely something to do with that unusual gait they have. Oh, is that her feet here? I love wombat feet. Can you see that? 
So these are well walked on. She's been living outside now for the last few months. So she does lots of digging. Right. right. Um, another question from the chat from Benjo. Uh, what's the wombat's predator? Oh, what a brilliant question. You guys have got such amazing questions. Adult wombats don't really have predators because they're so big. So an adult male weighs about 40 kilos and for short distances, he can run really fast. Um, and uh, if something tries to get into their burrow and a fox is the most likely thing here, um, they have this amazing um, plate on their rump. So on her, on her bum there is, is a big solid plate about the size of a dinner plate, which is rock hard. And if a, um, a fox tried to get into her burrow, she would simply crush it against the roof of the burrow with her, head, with her big strong rump and her, her very muscular body. But interestingly enough, the biggest threat to our wombats uh, in Australia is roadkill. So roads are, are go through their, their um, grazing areas now and mange, which is a parasitic infestation that kills them. And it's absolutely horrible. So those are the two biggest threats to wombats. They don't have any really big predators because they're such big animals and, and uh, live underground. What's uh, a question from Heath um, is, what kind of a wombat is Harriet? Love your questions. Harriet's a bare-nosed wombat. So her scientific name is uh, Vombatus ursinus, which means wombat that looks like a bear. So if you think of a bear, B-E-R, bare-nosed is B-A-R-E, meaning that she doesn't have um, a lot of fur on her nose. Now she's a different species to the southern hairy-nosed wombat and the northern hairy-nosed wombat. So the southern hairy-nosed wombat is not under threat. Um, there are plenty of those, although they still obviously have a tough life. Tough life. The northern hairy-nosed wombat is, is ex on the verge of extinction. However, it's being um, very carefully supported in a small spot in Queensland where I think there are 250 animals left. And they're quite different looking. They've got a very broad snout. Uh, and very widely separated nostrils. I'm sorry, sweet pea. Um, and they're quite different looking animals and they have different, um, very silky looking fur. Ours have fur that looks more like um, a dog's fur. So, but we don't have the hairy nosed wombats in the ACT or New South Wales even. Right. Yeah. Um, one last question from mm -hmm. me for both of you, Sarah and Lindy. If I wanted to get involved with the kind of work you guys do, how would I get involved? Do you want to take that one, Sarah? Yeah, sure. Um, so we have orientation sessions. Um, so anyone who's interested in getting involved with wildlife in the ACT, um, we run orientation sessions quite regularly. It tells you all about the different volunteering opportunities. Um, and we're running them online at the moment as well. So you can just join into a session like this. Um, some of the options for volunteering is you can be a carer like Lindy. Um, there's also rescue, transport, phone volunteering, um, sewing volunteers. There's, there's really lots of different things. Um, Lindy, is there anything that you wanted to add? Yeah, look, people can even do things like grow mealworms. We feed a lot of our little birds in spring. They need to eat live insects, so we grow mealworms. Um, and um, the other thing is, is donations because we're a charity and because these animals cost a lot of money to raise. This one has cost us well over $1,000 to get her to where she is now, and it'll cost more. We have 18 wombats in care at the moment, and they're all in care for about 18 months, so they all cost us about $1,000. So we love donations, which help us to um, provide everything our animals need. These all have a special formula, um, and uh, a 20 kilo bag of milk powder for the wombats costs about four and a half hundred dollars and we go through so many of these every year and that's just for wombats the possums have their own milk the wallabies have their own milk the birds have specialized feed um, so our, our animal feed costs us a lot um, so we we really 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 appreciate donation donations from people um, and for all the whole damage to Midland, these has been caused. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and we have, we, we have cages and things. Um, so we provide a lot of our volunteers with animal cages. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of expenses that, that we have to come up with as a charity. So that's the other way that people can help us. They're not in a position to volunteer at this stage. So we have a lots of 
a lot more questions from people, but we sort of run out of time. <laughs> what we'll do is we'll go through those questions and send you guys a follow-up email in which we can uh, answer some of those questions for you. Uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to take this opportunity to thank you, Lindy and Sarah, for this amazing talk and for introducing <laughs> us to Harriet, who is an absolute menace. She is. Uh, She's a wet bag. And uh, I wanted to talk a bit about next time's talk as well, which is I'm, I'm personally very excited about. Uh, it is going to be by the Vice Chancellor of ANU, Dr. Brian Schmidt. Brian is a Nobel Prize winner and a true Australian treasure. Uh, he's one of uh, a handful of Australian people to have ever have uh, won the Nobel Prize. And uh, he'll be talking about his Nobel Prize winning research next time about the acceleration of the universe and what dark energy has to do with it. Um, and Brian is super excited to be with us as, a, as our we. And I'm sure Harriet is just <laughs> excited to meet him next time as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you, uh, we'll be setting up an event bright, so we'll be on our lookout. And if you have any questions for Lindy or Sarah, go on the SAT Wildlife website and get in touch with them. Uh, otherwise, we'll. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And it's we'll been lovely to talk to you. Yeah. See you, you guys, all in two weeks' time. <laughs>